Acts chapter 22, starting with verse 30, reading through chapter 23, verse 31. I want to ask that you would stand as we read God's Word together. And it says this, But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lied. Uh, I'm sorry, (laughs) brothers, it was not a confession of lying. Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all conscience up to, up to this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, why would you reveal God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension rose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There, there were more than 40 who made, made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore, you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. So he went and, uh, and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are laying in ambush for him who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one, that you have informed me of these things. Then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me, 
that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers to state before you what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. I got I stumbled on the last word, Antipatris. What a name. Well, that is God's word, and I want to preach to you on it this morning, titling my sermon, And the Lord Stood By. Please pray with me as we ask God for his help. Father, we do come before you and say thank you for your word. Speak to us through it now, God. Help me to communicate with clarity and with passion your truth, not my own ideas. And I pray that you would open our hearts and our ears to understand your word, to apply it to our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may take a seat. In the year 1809, Napoleon invaded Austria. The citizens of Feldrick were discouraged and scared. As Napoleon's massive army was spotted on the hills. It happened to be an Easter Sunday. And the little town gathered together in the church for church, their church service that, that morning. And the pastor stood up before the congregation and opened his mouth and he said, Friends, We have been counting on our own strength, and apparently that has failed. As this is the day of our Lord's resurrection, let us ring the bells and have our services as usual and leave the matter in his hands. And so they went ahead with that and they rang the church bells. And as the church bells rang, Napoleon, hearing the bells, figured that the Austrian army had arrived, and he fled with his entire army. Look, I just want to point out to you this morning that God works through the ordinary, regular stuff of life, even the ringing of a bell for your safety, for your protection, for your good, and for his purposes. Theologically, this is called providence. Meaning, the bells weren't rung out of luck. It didn't just so happen that they rang the bell. But that was part of God's plan for Feldrick, Austria, that morning as they gathered with Napoleon's armies on the hills. There are thousands and thousands of things that happen every day in your life that don't just simply happen, but they are part of God's ultimate plan for your good and for His glory. God works behind the scenes. And so even if you are currently experiencing a scene of your life that you don't like, you can still trust Him. Because you know that God is in control of this scene. What discouragements do you face right now in your life in which you cannot trust God? Is there any difficulty that you currently face That is outside of God's control. What about something as terrible as depression? Well, Charles Spurgeon, a man who himself dealt with depression off and on for many years, Spurgeon said this, he says, if God is in control, then that means he is in control of my depression. And then he went on to say that fate is blind, but providence has eyes. In verse 11, as Paul is sort of in the grip of the lion's den, it says the Lord stood by him. 
how does the Lord then stand by Paul? It wasn't actually through miracles, but it's through providence. It's through God working behind the scene. What is providence? Well, John Piper, in his 752-page book that he recently released called Providence, defines providence this way. He says, the providence of God is his purposeful sovereignty by which he will completely success, su- completely successful, he will be, I'm sorry, completely successful in the achievement of his ultimate goal for the universe. God's providence carries his plans into action, guides all things toward his ultimate goal, and leads to the final consummation. Meaning every event, every word spoken, every failed pl- uh, uh, plan, every loss, every win, is all part of God fulfilling His perfect plan for your life and for His glory, which ends in the consummation of all things, a.k.a. Jesus returning and you rising from the dead. Every raindrop, every lightning bolt, every snowflake, every sunset, all works together to fulfill God's ultimate plan for the universe and for your life. So as we look at this text and apply it to your lives, I want want you to ask yourself, in what ways am I currently in the grip of discouragement? In what ways uh, am I facing a scene that I don't like? In what ways are there some things going on in my life that don't make any sense? And I want you to look at Paul's life here and what God does through Paul's life, and I want you to be encouraged this morning. Now, first, before we do so, let's back up. The Apostle Paul, throughout the book of Acts, has been on three missionary journeys, and he's willing to obey God no matter what. His friends have encouraged him, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, you're going to suffer there. And Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem because God wants me to go to Jerusalem. Meaning he's willing to obey God even if it means what? Come on. Don't let that turkey get you. Even if it means suffering. No matter what. So Paul gets to Jerusalem and suffering begins. And Paul's okay with that because Paul has already made it clear that his life is worth nothing to him only that he might finish the race. And so he's in Jerusalem. We saw last week how he's immediately hit with all kinds of lies and all kinds of accusations. He ends up in prison, and uh, and then we get to verse 30. And that's where we we pick it up this morning. So look at verse 30, it says, uh, of chapter 22, he says, But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why... He was being accused by the Jews, so this is the tribune trying to figure out what they have against Paul. He still doesn't understand. He's confused. It says, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he, the tribune, the uh, the Roman commander, brought Paul down and set him before them. Now, the next scene that plays out renews our confidence in God's providential power. And I want to summarize what happens next with with this phrase. Since God is working behind the scenes, we need not be discouraged with difficulty. Let me say that again. Since God is working behind the scenes, you and I need not be discouraged with difficulty. How do we deal with difficulty? Well, look at the text. Paul now appears before the chief priests and the council. The chief priests and the council in Jerusalem is sort of the supreme court of Israel. Well, surely the supreme court of Israel must judge with fairness, correct? Well, remember how they treated Jesus? Why do you expect them to treat Paul any different? If they hated Jesus, they're going to hate Paul. And so he stands before the, uh, the Supreme Court of Israel, and Paul begins with his own defense. This is what he says in verse 1. He says, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up until this day. Now, immediately when he says that, the high priest loses it 
and strikes Paul in the face. And then I think Paul actually loses it just a little bit. In verse 3, Paul sort of lashes back, not with his fist, but with his words. And he says, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Whitewashed wall meaning a hypocrite. That's, he's borrowing from Jesus' imagery there. You know, if you can imagine, I don't know, imagine that somebody just painted walls white just to cover up what was underneath. <laughs> it's not hard to imagine, is it? God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. And then he says, are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law you order me to be struck? And then uh, Paul is rebuked for speaking back to the high priest. And then in verse 5, I think Paul sarcastically says, well, I didn't know he was the high priest. Now, I think Paul had to have known he was the high priest. It must have been clear. Theologians are a little conflicted on this. I think Paul was being a little sarcastic there, saying, based on the way he's acting, I have no evidence that he is the high priest of God. But Paul does, in verse 5, seem to pull back his words, withdraws his accusation against the high priest. Here's the question I want to go after first, is why the visceral reaction from the high priest? Why does the high priest immediately strike Paul on the face? Well, it's because Paul has said he has lived his life before God in all good conscience up until this day. That's got multiple layers of problems for the high priest. First, how can anybody say that? And second, if he's been going around to these Gentiles saying that, that, that they are filled with the Holy Spirit in the same way that the Jews are filled with the Holy Spirit, how can he go about this mission and, and claim to be living with a clear conscience before God? Now, these, these would make up my first two points in how you deal with discouragement. The first one is this. You have to know your hope. And by that, I mean the gospel. Know your hope. Paul was not perfect. He did not live a sinless life even after he was saved. Yet Paul had a clear conscience. How can somebody who has sin in their life, who has committed wrongs, say, I have lived my entire life with a clear conscience before God? Well, check it out, friends. Christians don't have a clear conscience because we are perfect. We have a clear conscience because in the gospel message, we have it built in to the gospel message how we maintain a clear conscience. And that is this. Go to the cross. Go to Christ. See that your sin was taken care of on the cross. And there's even a mechanism. Confess your sins to one another. And he's faithful and just to forgive you, give your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Meaning we maintain a clear conscience before God, not because of our own righteousness. Now, it's because of whose righteousness? Jesus Christ. Let's talk about him for a sec. Jesus Christ had a clear, clear conscience himself. He was the only human being who ever lived who had a clear conscience based on his own righteousness. Because he lived the life of obedience before God that you and I should have lived. And when he died on the cross, he took our shame, he bore the wrath for our sin, he took our guilt, and he gave us his righteousness. And so therefore, all who turn from their sins and trust in Jesus Christ have a slate that has been wiped clean. Meaning you can stand then in confidence before God, forgiven of your sins with the, co with the, uh, the covering of Jesus Christ's own righteousness and say, I have a clean conscience. What Paul is saying is, is I don't have any ongoing sins that are not confessed that I know of. I'm not continuing to love my sin instead of my Savior. Yes, I fall. Yes, I sin. But I maintain a clear conscience before God as I go to the cross and I'm washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I wonder, church, if you know that kind of clear conscience. 
I wonder if you know the, the, the freedom of a clean conscience that you only get through the righteousness and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Through grace. Through faith. Come to Christ. Know what it means to be forgiven of your sins. Know what this kind of clear conscience means. He died for you, and three days later, He rose from the dead on your behalf. And so, how does this relate to our discouragement? Because He lives... I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. Because I know He lives. Amen? Amen. Secondly, you need to know your mission. Know your hope, the Gospel. And know your mission. So, Paul is accused of twisting the Scriptures. He's accused of of things that he has not done. Why? It's because Paul has been on a mission to the Gentiles. He's been taking the hope of salvation out of Jerusalem, out of, away from the temple, away from the, the, the people, and going to places like Ephesus and Corinth and Philippi and saying you can have union with God right now through confessing your sins and trusting in Jesus Christ. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul knew his mission. And so therefore, he was okay when the problems came. This is secondly what he meant by he has a clear conscience. Meaning he 100% believes the gospel. And he also 100% believes his mission. To take the gospel into all of the world, preaching the salvation of of sinners through the forgiveness offered from the cross of Jesus Christ, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you know your mission? Are you confident in your own mission? Well, what is it? Preach the gospel. Well, look, all of life, from your friendships to your job to, to your duties, uh, to your school classes, to your neighbors. All of life, every relationship is meant for us to be lived on mission before God to snatch souls out of hell. It doesn't mean that we are all full-time evangelists, but it does mean that every act of our life is laying down our lives as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice before God. High school students, don't wait until you're done with high school before you start sharing your faith with your friends. I can't tell you how many testimonies I hear where someone says, I was in high school and a, a fellow student shared the gospel with me and I was saved. Life on mission for Christ begins now. Uh, 40 to 50 to 60 hour a week workers. Don't wait until life gets simpler to be on mission and to share your faith. Again, I can't tell you how many testimonies begin with, I was at work and a co-worker shared the gospel with me and I was saved. Don't wait until life gets simpler. Life begins now on mission for Jesus Christ. Parents of young children. Again, don't wait until they're older to begin sharing the gospel with them, to begin family worship, to begin teaching them the, the, the doctrines of our faith. I, I, I can't tell you how many testimonies begin with, when I was a kid, my mom and my dad taught me the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I was saved. Life on mission for Christ begins now. Our church covenant reads, we will work to bring up any who are under our care in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and by a pure and loving example, seek the salvation of our friends and family. Our mission is to lift up the hope of our salvation. 
Now again, how does all of this relate to us dealing with discouragements? Well, difficulty for the Christian just simply becomes another opportunity to lift up the name of Jesus. For Paul, God's sovereign work is always at work through, through everything that happens to him. And so when he finds himself in a jail, it doesn't divert his mission. It just gives him another venue for his mission. This is why it's so important for us to get the gospel right and to get our mission right. Because if the gospel is, oh, Jesus came to give you a good life, and if your mission is to live the best life now, well, suffering will always bring you discouragement. Because in your suffering, you can't fulfill neither the gospel nor the mission. But if the gospel is Christ died for sinners, if we get the gospel right, and if the mission is to proclaim the gospel, then suffering merely becomes another opportunity for you to lift high the name of Jesus. Are you with me? How do you deal with discouragement? Well, know that your discouragement is a new venue for you. In your discouragement, it's a new venue for you to lift up Jesus' name. Know the gospel. Know your hope. Know your mission. Thirdly, you also need to know your ally. Know your ally. The narrative continues in Acts chapter 23. And Paul realizes that the the council is split into two parties, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so Paul has a new strategy in mind. Paul, being a Pharisee, is going to appeal to the Pharisees, and I'm sure he's hoping to win their favor and maybe use that as a way uh, to kind of get out of this lion's lair. Uh, If you grew up in Sunday school, you might remember the old old phrase, uh, how did it go, Pharisees are, uh, the Pharisees, help me Jesus, Uh, it's been a long time since I was in Sunday school. How do we remember Pharisees and Sadducees? Pharisees believed in the the resurrection, but they weren't fair, you see. Come on, somebody. Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Therefore, they were sad. You see. Now you know. The more you know. And so so there's these theological differences between these two camps. The Pharisees believed in the supernatural. They believed in angels and spirits, and they believed in the hope of the resurrection. The Sadducees denied the supernatural. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. And they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so Paul sees this, and he's like, I'm going to appeal to the Pharisees. And so he says, hey, I I was uh, born of Pharisee brothers, verse 6 of chapter 23. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. He's appealing to the Pharisees there. And as a result, he wins the support of some of the Pharisees on the council. But by the time we get to verse 10, we realize that his his strategy is kind of working against him. By this point, the dissension becomes so violent. In verse 10, it says that the tribune is afraid that Paul is going to be torn into pieces by the chief priests of Israel. He sinks deeper into the lion's mouth. The tribune then, he's the Roman commander. He, he quickly moves uh, to, to rescue Paul from the fangs of this council. And he brings him into a prison cell. And uh, the, the sun sets and it's now nighttime. And, and it says in verse 11, the following night, look at this, the Lord stood by him. Imagine if verse 11 wasn't there. That night, Paul was all alone, it might read. 
That night, it might say, he had no hope. He had no future. He was in the belly of discouragement. But that's not what it says, does it? It says, that night, the Lord stood by him and and actually came with a message. And he says, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. What's he saying? He's saying, you are not going to die here. It seems as if you are not going to ever make it out of Jerusalem, but the Lord stood by. You're not going to die. I still have work for you. And that is in Rome. You're going to Rome. Later in 2 Timothy 4.17, Paul writing a letter uh, about the this, this same sort of time in his life. He says, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. So that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Like I said, my third point is to know your ally. If you're going to deal with discouragement, you need to know who it is that stands by you. You guys know the oldie, when the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light you see no I won't be afraid no I won't shed a tear just as long as you stand stand by me and it's so far so good right that could be about Jesus <laughs> we could sing that almost but this is where the author goes wrong so darling darling stand now, look when the night has come And the land is dark, meaning you are in the pit of despair. You need more than your darling to stand by you. If you're sitting by your loved one, look at your loved one and say, Darling, I need more than you. Just playing with you. That that song was written by, by Ben King. And Ben King said that that song was inspired by Sam Cooke's 1959 spiritual called Stand By Me, Father. Sam Cooke got it right. Sam Cooke's spiritual was based on the 1905 hymn that we sang this morning by Charles Albert Tinley called Stand By Me. And that song was written in the spirit of the slave songs which he heard growing up himself as a slave in the South. The hope of his parents, of his grandparents, who said God is in control. No matter the trials and tribulations that we face, we have a God who is in control. Even when things don't make sense all around us, God stands by us. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship out on the sea, thou who rulest, wind and water, stand by me. In your discouragement, church, the Lord stands by Yes, the powers of this world are ugly, but His power is greater. Because no matter what this world can do, God is behind the scenes in all things, working all things for His good, or for your good and for His glory. If your ally is God Himself, well then, my last point is this, you have to know who your God is. Know your God. Know your hope, know your mission, know your ally, and know your God. In the Old Testament, there is this story, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, of a young lady named Esther. A beautiful young woman who was brought as a potential queen into the palace, outside of her will, into the palace of Xerxes. She was then appointed to be Xerxes' queen. Her cousin, Mordecai, one day, hears of a plot for Xerxes' life. 
Mordecai then goes to his cousin, the queen, and says, hey, I just heard that these people are trying to kill the king. Esther then goes to Xerxes and explains to him that there's a plot against his life. The plotters are then found and hanged. As time goes on, Esther herself hears of another plot. A plot against the Jews themselves. Esther herself is Jewish. Mordecai is Jewish. And there's a man who's the right-hand man to Xerxes named Haman. And Haman hates Mordecai, her cousin. And so he comes up with this whole plot on destroying Mordecai's people. Well, for such a time as this, Esther is in the palace. And so she begs the king, Xerxes, for uh, the life of the Jews. There's then a uh, moment in which she comes before the king and she says, Hey, uh, you, you never rewarded my cousin, he doesn't know it's her cousin. You never rewarded Mordecai for saving your life. It's time to give him a reward. And so what, what Xerxes does is he takes a royal robe and he puts it on cousin Mordecai. And then he has Haman, who hates Mordecai, parade Mordecai around the city, giving him glory. Well, at this point, Haman builds gallows to, to kill Mordecai. He's ready for this. There's a big banquet. Everybody's there. And at the banquet, Esther comes before Xerxes and she says, out of despair, she says that there is a plot to kill my people. Xerxes is appalled and infuriated. He says, who is it that is plotting to kill your people? And she points to Haman. It's, it's, it's that guy. It's your right-hand man. As the story ends up, Haman is hanged on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai, and the Jews are saved. Now, check this out. Throughout the entire book of Esther, God's name is not mentioned one time. But God is on every page in every chapter, in every verse, yeah. operating behind the scenes. Did you think it was happenstance yeah. that Esther was in the palace? Did you think it was just luck that the plots were overheard? No, no, no. With, with God, there, nothing, nothing just happens with God. But God's providence is always at work even when it doesn't make any sense. Everything in your life is happening as a result of God's providence at work. How does God then stand by Paul? What does that actually look like? Well, what it looks like is providence. As bad as things are, God stands by. And in verse 12, it says that there is a plot made for Paul's life. There are 40 Jews who commit to not eat or drink anything until Paul is dead. And they're coming up with this grand plot. And it's deadly. And it's very detailed. We're given all the details. Uh, they, they want the council to go ahead and tell the tribune that they want to meet with Paul again. And while the tribune is bringing Paul to meet with the council, there are going to be 40 vigilantes hiding out, waiting for Paul, and they're going to kill him. They're going to ambush the tribune's people and Paul, and Paul will be dead. And they're not going to eat or drink anything until this happens. Now look at verse 16. It says, now the son of Paul's sister, that's Paul's nephew, now the son of Paul's sister heard of the ambush. Paul's nephew then brings the news to Paul. Paul then tells the centurion to take the nephew to the tribune. The, the tribune listens to the, the nephew's message. And look at verse 23. It says that the tribune gets together this whole militia of people to protect Paul and to get him out of Jerusalem uh, that night 
200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen. Under the cover of night, Paul is going to escape Jerusalem with an army made up of Roman soldiers. He's going to accompany this militia with a letter going straight up north out of Jerusalem to Governor Felix where he's asking for a fair trial. Now that happens in verses 12 through 33. Uh, Similar to Esther. Not once in verses 12 through 33 do you see God's name mentioned. But God is behind every single verse. He's behind every single action. Where do you see God at work? Well, just one example. Verse 16, Now the son of Paul's sister heard of the ambush. Was that luck? Did he just so happen to hear of the ambush? Was that coincidence? No, nothing just happens with God. But he's at work. Where do we see God at work in verses 12 through 33? The nephew was in the right place at the right time. The nephew heard the plot and told Paul. The centurion was willing to listen to the nephew. The tribune believed the nephew's message. The tribune is willing to keep the news a secret and create a response plan. The tribune provides a large militia as an escort for protection. The tribune orders the travel to take place under the cover of night. The tribune provides a letter to Felix. Don't you see God at work? Like all of that stuff had to come together for Paul's good, for his safety, for God's promise to Paul to come to fruition. And it did. Because God is at work behind the scenes, church. We've got to take a step back. Paul was born a Roman citizen, which provided him rights. Oh, was that just luck? No, no, no. When Paul's mama fell in love with Paul's daddy, and the two of them got married, supposedly, consummated, father was a Roman citizen. Paul's born as a Roman citizen. I'm saying even in that, God was at work for this moment. Don't you see how God works? This is all operating within the system of the Roman Empire where there were particular protections for citizens. I'm just saying that God ordered and designed every single event, not only of this chapter, but of Paul's entire life to fulfill his plans and purposes for the universe and for Paul. Verse 11, it says, the Lord stood by. And then verses 12 through verse 33, we see how the Lord stands by. And that is through his providence. How do we face daily discouragements? Know that the Lord stands by. How? Through his providence in your life. Know your hope. Know your mission. Know your ally. Know your God. This is the God of all power. Can I close with just one more story from the Bible? The story of Joseph, I think, is one of the greatest highlights of God's providence. Joseph was kidnapped by his brothers, and the Lord stood by. Joseph was sold to slave traders on their way to Egypt, and the Lord stood by. Joseph then, once he got to Egypt, was lied on by Potiphar's wife, and the Lord stood by. Joseph was thrown into a dungeon and the Lord stood by. Joseph was forgotten in that dungeon and the Lord still stood by. Every moment of his life was all suffering, discouragement, and confusion. If he tried to figure it out in the middle of it, he would have lost his faith in God. And you are in the middle of it now. 
Oh, judge not God's design by our feeble sense, but trust Him for His work. Trust Him. Well, in Joseph's life, it all kind of pans out, doesn't it? He eventually interprets Pharaoh's dreams. He then uh, has the opportunity to save the whole known world during a famine. He then brings his family to live with him in Egypt. But even as the story goes on, as Israel grows in Egypt, they still have to trust God, don't they? It'll be 400 years of slavery in Egypt before they ever taste the milk and honey of the promised land. Meaning all of life is waiting. All of life is trusting when things don't seem to make sense. But in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. Every day you face difficulties. Some of your difficulties are small. You're, You're... late for a meeting and you can't find your keys that never happens to me but the lord stands by amen you're feeding your baby and they throw up all over the clothes that you are about to wear to work the lord stands by in all of these things even when problems and discouragement seem a little more earth shattering You try to love somebody and you get run over. You're a Christian and you get rejected for your faith. The Lord stands by. Even when life is excruciating, a loved one dies. You're imprisoned for your faith. You're misunderstood and a plot is made for your life. Let me ask you this question. In all of these things, Are we conquered by these difficulties? In all of these things, are we conquered by our discouragements? No. The Bible answers that question and says no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Look, there are some things that God has done in your life that you will never know about. There are some things that He has kept you from that you will never know about. God has changed some aspects of your situation that you will never even know about because God is at work in all things for your good and for His glory. You didn't know. You don't know how you ever got out of the lion's mouth. But you did. And that's because God was orchestrating. God was working. There are some lions who were waiting in their hunt, in their prowl for you, that God dealt with and you never even knew about it. Because God is working for your good and for your glory. Look, there are some difficulties that you went through in your life And God has showed you over and over. He has proved to you that difficulties don't destroy you. But they are all part of God's perfect plan. Oh, in church, there are some difficulties that you face that will never make sense this side of eternity. And that's okay. You can still trust Him. And one day, we will see Christ face to face. And there will be no more question marks of our life. And we will be able to, for all of eternity, give God the glory for the great things He has done. Even when things didn't seem great, they were all part of His plan to get you home. To get you to that moment when Jesus Christ returns and the dead are raised to life. And we live forever with God. Do you trust Him, church? Do you trust Him in your discouragements? Because God is purposeful in His sovereignty. Through which He is completely successful in achieving His purposes. 
for the universe, for those in Christ, your ultimate good is part of His ultimate plan. Every detail, every event, every aspect of your life is God carrying out His plan for your life and for the world until the day that Jesus returns and we are raised with a new body. How many of you know that your discouragements are not disconnected from your ultimate destiny in heaven? For that, we can praise Him. Amen? Amen. Praise Him in your discouragements. Praise Him in your trials. Praise Him with the question marks of life. Praise Him when you don't like the scene that you're currently living out. Because God is at work behind the scenes for your good. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You that You are the God who is at work. Your sovereignty is played out day by day, minute by minute in our lives. And we call it providence. We thank You, God, for including us in Your plan of redemption, of hope for this world. We pray, God, that as we face our discouragements today, that we will trust You. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.